Hello there. We here at the Price of Pain podcast are marching on through this Delta variant. So you may notice uh, that we've got masks on here in the studio. It sounds a little differently. Sometimes you can hear us breathing through them. And if you're watching the video, you may notice that my mask has a really fancy Price of Pain logo on it, courtesy of my buddy Brian Mead and his local company here in Gainesville, Alma Mater Design. Does fantastic work. We really appreciate him providing the masks for the show. Speaking of the show, on today, we have Jen Nichols. She has a PhD in biomedical engineering, and she runs the Musculoskeletal Biomechanics Lab here at the University of Florida College of Engineering. We have a pretty fun talk today about some of her work and how she uses computer modeling to, uh, to figure out and predict how the human hand and wrist and arm move. It's really fascinating stuff. It's outside of my realm, so I'm along for the ride with you all. And so I'm sure that, just like me, you'll have many questions. While you're in the process of liking and subscribing and commenting, go ahead and send those questions in. You know, like, what is machine learning? Or, hey Josh, how do I like and subscribe again? And you can send those in to our email address at priceofpainpodcast at gmail.com or even just comment on the YouTube channel if that's where you're taking in the podcast. Either way, I really hope you enjoy this episode. So I'm going to throw it over to Kat Antunes on the ones and twos. She's going to get this thing rolling. Welcome to The Price of Pain, brought to you by the Pain Research and Intervention Center of Excellence at the University of Florida. Let's join host Dr. Joshua Crow in conversations with scientists, healthcare providers, and industry professionals as we delve into the highly subjective experience of pain in the ongoing effort to reveal its influence on our everyday lives. Depending on the person, some people have it figured out, like I was five years old and I knew I wanted to be a doctor. Most people are not that story. Where do you fall on that spectrum? Um, so I was the five-year-old that wanted to be a doctor. And then in high school, I made the realization that I really didn't want to be a doctor um, for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm actually one of those people where all the medical dramas on TV actually convinced me that it was a bad idea, not a good idea. I feel like a lot of people get swayed into being like, oh, I want to be exactly what was ever shown so, on television. And I was just like, I'm not sure I want, like, the stress of caring for people. Ah, so that, um, is that what, you know, watching, what, like, ER or something? Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah, it's too stressful. Yeah, you watch yeah. ER, and um, even though one of the things that is well known about those shows is, like, there's a higher rate of, like life success of the like oh cpr always works on television which is not <laughs> right. how it actually works in the real world it was kind of like i don't ever want to be responsible um for like life or death decisions for mm -hmm. on that individual clinical basis which i kind of laugh about now because as a biomedical engineer i have the ability to design devices or you know put things into production that could be life or death on the scales of hundreds of thousands if it goes wrong Exactly. Um, but the upside is, is, you know, also what you don't see on those shows is, oh, yeah, you know, trauma patient, trauma patient. Uh, could you take this Lego out of my son's nose yeah. kind of thing? So <laughs> all of the all of the non glamorous parts of that, you also get to skip out on as well. So, yeah. And like the one of the great things about kind of my career trajectory. So I did my undergrad at Tufts um, I and my bachelor's degree is in mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And that was a very conscious decision because I grew up in Connecticut and I was not ready to go really far away from home, um, especially now that I'm in Florida. I tell the students, it's like, if you're from Miami, you like you're braver than I was for coming all the way to <laughs> University of Florida. Like that's that's yes, I went out of state, but it was two hours right, where right. Florida is a much longer state. And towards the end of my time at Tufts, I realized there was just so much more to learn Um I'd had the opportunity to take some bio um, electives and kind of biomaterials and biomedical devices. And I said, oh, that's a really cool path for grad school. When you when you first started off, though, um, mechanical engineering for your undergrad, yep. correct? What um, prior to those electives, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do? You, you definitely. Well, at least it sounds like you say you definitely didn't want whatever you envisioned as being a physician. But as an engineer, what did you think? You, I mean, was it pocket protector, hard hat? Um, what, what were you thinking was going to be? 
I liked the idea of kind of, of being able to build things. I was good at physics and math and those kinds of things, and it was a natural fit. Mm-hmm. And mostly I liked the people that I met kind of in the engineering school. And I don't think I, you don't, one of the hard things about engineering, and this is true of a lot of our disciplines, is you go to college, your first two years as an undergraduate is a lot of required courses. You take chemistry, you take physics, you don't really get to understand what your profession's all about until your third and fourth year, Mm -hmm. where you start to say like, oh, in engineering, you do a design project and you start to see what that actual like, oh, this is how you bring a product to market. This is how you actually solve a problem from scratch is that like kind of a capstone thing like design is in in architecture for example like your your project is your big deal yeah it's it's typically the way it's structured here at university of florida and a lot of um, schools throughout the nation are it's a two semester project oh, oh, so okay. you do senior design across two semesters and it's really you're learning the design process so i think one of the things that's hard for people to understand is the like what's the difference between an engineer and a scientist? And you get that a lot as a PhD in engineering. It's like, well, don't you do science? And the answer is yes. We do form questions, develop hypotheses, and then test those hypotheses, which Mm -hmm. is the scientific method. But we also, as engineers, use the design process that says, okay, we're going to go find a problem. We're going to scope why that is a problem and how we can fix that problem and make decisions about solving that problem that mean, like, it's still an educated guessing iterative solution but it's different than kind of the scientific method yeah well all right so what was your project um so i built a tick robot okay so as in like a bug tick yeah so ticks big problem in the northeast okay one of the leading researchers in ticks is at tufts veterinary school and he really wanted a consumer product that you could put on the edges of lawns so ticks primarily exist in like the debris between the like, I'm not quite in forest, I'm not on beautiful cut lawn, I'm in that kind of transition space. I've learned my first new thing of the podcast, thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) So we actually went the way that ticks were collected at that time and are probably still collected by graduate students to this day, is you take a giant flag of a felt-like material, you brush it around the leaves, and then you collect ticks. So... The goal was to build a robot that, you know, had that kind of same fabric. I can drag fabric. Mm -hmm. I can gather the ticks. And then I can come up with a way to um, dispose of the ticks so that it's not invading kind of the residential areas. Cool. So that was our senior project. Okay. (laughs) A little different from what you do now in some ways. Obviously, the the, like you said, the design method and... And whatnot that leads up to that, I'm sure you still employ on a regular basis now, but a uh, little different than than looking at what you're looking at now. Yeah. And the, kind of by the end of undergrad, it was like, OK, I want to move, you know, into things that actually involve people. OK. Um, not a huge fan of insects. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up um, having the opportunity to do graduate school at Northwestern. And one of the really cool things about Northwestern is their campus is split between Evanston, Illinois, where kind of most of the academics are. But the biomedical engineering department also has space on the medical school campus, which is downtown. And at that time, that space was actually in the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, which has recently um, rebranded as the Shirley Ryan Ability Labs when they moved across the street. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about the Ability Lab is they really had this vision of, I want to integrate research and clinical care into the same space. So... What that was during my grad school was we were in the same hospital, um, which was a really rewarding environment because you saw, like, if you went to lunch, you saw patients and you said, oh, my research is actually, like, impacting the people around me. The space now, it's actually, like, researchers are on the exact same floor that you're going for clinic and physical therapy and, like, you're fully integrated with the clinical teams. So... My PhD work focused on creating musculoskeletal models of the upper limb, Mm -hmm. and I worked with Dr. Wendy Murray, who's really a pioneer in that field, and I think the, when you say you're going to create a computer model, everybody says, oh, that's really complicated and really hard, and particularly now when I am talking to students, trying to convince them to kind of join the lab and that they too can do this. I point out that everything in our computer model is actually things that you learn in physics one. Oh. So 
everybody's heard of Isaac Newton. Everybody knows that Isaac Newton has a bunch of laws and helps us discover gravity. And one of those laws is F equals MA. Mm -hmm. So force is the product of mass times acceleration. Mm -hmm. And that's really all we do in our Musk-Scottle model. So you can take anyone who's passed either high school or first year college physics have them imagine like holding a ball statically in their hand mm -hmm. and they can be like, oh, the ball is applying a force downwards on my hand and they can solve that problem. That's a physics one type problem. Mm -hmm. It's an easy problem because, you know, you're not moving. So mm -hmm. what we do is say, OK, now I'm going to grasp that ball. Mm -hmm. I have a computer model that can say, OK, I'm going to have forces at each of those fingers. Contributing to those forces are all of the muscles in my arm. Each of those muscles is creating a different force. Now, in your hand, you have over two dozen muscles. Mm -hmm. So I now have two dozen force vectors. Those forces are applying at different angles and different areas. They're um, also causing my joints to move. I'm now doing dynamic things. And, oh, maybe my index finger is moving faster than my middle finger. So it gets really complicated really right. quickly. Right. So you just are like, oh, I don't want to solve that problem by hand anymore. I'm going to have a computer model that does it for me. Interesting. And then the really cool thing about computer models, too, is you get the ability to change whatever you want. So I can test things out in a computer model that I can't test in a person. Mm -hmm. So my Ph.D. work actually looked at two different surgeries for wrist osteoarthritis. And if you talk to hand surgeons and say, OK, how do you choose between surgery A and surgery B? There are some clinical indications that say, OK, these unique features of if this bone's involved or this mm -hmm. is where the area of cartilage damage is. But there's also um, personal factors like, well, I'm more comfortable doing surgery A, so it's easier and faster for me to do it. So maybe I'm going to lean towards that if there really isn't a clinical reason here. Mm -hmm. So we looked in the computer models and said, okay, can we start to differentiate what's actually the difference between these and kind of predictively say what's actually happening in these surgeries to the muscles, what's happening to your functional outcomes. Interesting. Well, so, uh, you know, and I think that anybody that's taken undergraduate anatomy, now that may be nobody listening right now, <laughs> but for those who have forearm musculature, which motivates yep. the hand and fingers, is uh, one of the most difficult sections of gross anatomy to work through because it's not intuitive and whatnot. And so, um, I mean, even, so if I, if I think to, um, to grad school, when I was going through cadaver anatomy, um, even, even physiological differences, uh, and genetic differences between individuals. Um, sometimes, you know, you have a, uh, you have a, a muscle just to keep it simple. You have a muscle in your forearm that helps you to cup your palm and whatnot. And out of every 10 people, there's a couple who don't have that. And maybe yeah. they only don't have it in one arm, but do have it in the other. Very, I guess, very diverse representation uh, in across phenotypes of, of the musculature. Can you start to say, okay, well, what if this person um, primarily is left-handed? How, how do they, how do they um, move differently in their left hand and their right hand? Or if this person had this type of injury or doesn't have this muscle genetically whatever the case may be, can you, can you use your model to look at those differences as well? Yeah. So the easiest thing to do, you know, is take muscles in and out. Like right. you can, you can delete a muscle in the model a lot easier than you can delete it from a person, <laughs> okay. um, which is a great kind of first step in looking at some injuries. So one of the um, topics my lab's starting to look at is rotator cuff injuries. So ro rotator cuff tears are a well-known injury. Mm -hmm. And you stop being able to have force transmit across that tendon. Now, completely destroying the tendon so that no force is going across it is extremely rare right. and not how that injury happens. But when we start modeling it, that's where we start is say, OK, what if we just take out this muscle? What like that's worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And then you can backtrack and say, like, OK, what if I make it 50 percent stronger? Mm -hmm. What if I make you 25 percent stronger? So that brings up an interesting point, at least interesting to me. One unique characteristic of the shoulder as opposed to the hip, because it seems like more often than not, when, when I speak to biomechanists and throughout graduate school, I was surrounded by a lot of them, um, 
it's you know either arm, upper extremity biomechanics or lower extremity biomechanics yep. most often, right? What's fascinating about the difference between the two on a very superficial level is how those two, you know, say hip joint and shoulder joint in comparison are both ball and socket joints. But structurally, that's a, a very loose association, right? You know, a shallower socket in the shoulder. Um, and I'm obviously not yep. telling you things that you don't already know, but for those who are listening along, because I'm going to get to a question here. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of the, the stabilization in the shoulder, as opposed to the hip, comes from the musculature, comes from interarticular negative pressure. You know, there's a vacuum in the capsule and, and all this. Can you model, for example, some of the things that go a little bit awry when you have a shoulder injury, like you had mentioned, a rotator cuff muscle, other muscles begin to compensate for that muscle's purpose. That muscle inactivates and so on and so forth. And that's actually one of the, the most difficult things throughout rehabilitation uh, of injuries or of surgical interventions to injuries in the shoulder is to get the muscles back to working how they're supposed to. But in order to do that, you've got to figure which muscles are going above and beyond to make up for the one that's damaged. Can your models do that also? Yeah, so that's a great question. And it's one that we're still trying to figure out. So when you change something in the model, the model can predict how, like... Because it gets complex really quickly, right? Yeah, I I can say, okay, I want the model to generate a movement. Like, I want you to reach out, grab a cup, and bring it back so that you can drink it. Mm -hmm. And it will find a solution to that. And if I change the model, it will find a different solution to that problem. But whether or not that's actually what people are doing in the real world is still a very open question. And the kind of the flip side is we can also collect a bunch of experimental data and, you know, record a bunch of people doing Mm -hmm. that same Mm -hmm. reaching task and then use that to drive our model and see how that like how are people different. So the lab's really taking both approaches to say, okay, how do people actually compensate? So when you do that, when you compare uh, a human versus the model. What are some of the ways you you capture the data? I mean, I assume you use motion capture, right? Um, actually, I, I'm pretty sure I've been in your lab space um, with uh, with Dr. Elisa Johnson as she was working through a study that she was developing with you. But um, so you have motion capture, I, I, if I remember correctly. But do you do things like so? For example, talking about you know muscular contributions to a movement, you know, like synergistically. Um, can you do like indwelling EMG and stuff like that to see what's working? And... Yeah. So motion capture, like, I love the fact that you can now talk about motion capture and everybody instantly knows what it is <laughs> right. because of Pixar and Hollywood and yep, the gaming yep, industry. Yep. So we use the exact same technology. We actually, the um, company that makes our cameras is the same one that's used by Pixar, which um, students always find really cool. Mm-hmm. Like the drastic difference is we have 12 cameras when, you know, the Lego movie is made, they make it with hundreds. Right, right. Um, but the in order to record muscles, we do use electromyography or EMG. And the cool thing is about muscle is every time you use a muscle, it emits an electrical signal. So if you think back to like the first time you learned about circuits and you were given two wires, a battery and a light bulb, it was like, oh, if I connect the two wires to the edges of the battery, the light bulb lights up. Well, I can do, think about that the same way with electromyography. If my muscles know the battery and I connect two wires to it, I can record whether that muscle's on or off, whether that light is turning on or off. And that's basically what an EMG sensor does, is it just records kind of that baseline, like, are you completely relaxed, creating zero effort? Are you 100% on um, kind of maximizing your force? And the complicated thing is you have a lot of muscles that are near the surface of your skin. You can do that with a surface electrode. Mm -hmm. And... That's kind of like just a large sticker. Um, people don't really object to that. But we also want to know what the muscles that are deeper in your body are doing. And that's where the indwelling EMG comes in. So Circle back to the forearm and the shoulder where you yeah. have layers of muscles. So this, you know, surface maybe is not as accurate, right? Yeah. So okay. we actually do, we do in the lab do needle insertions. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very small needle. Everybody like is always like, oh, you're going to put a giant needle in me. It's like, it's very small. It's about the same size, if not smaller than the ones they use to do blood draws. Okay. And in that needle, there's two wires that when I, and it's a hollow needle. So when you take the needle out, the two wires stay in. And those two wires are about the size of a human hair. Oh, okay. So when it goes in initially, you you notice it. But after you've moved around for 
you know, a couple minutes, it, you really don't notice it anymore. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't actually it kind of affect your movement. The I actually think the wires are not really the issue um, in affecting movement when we record motion. It's all the extra stuff. Like by the time I've put motion capture spheres on you mm -hmm. and I've put the like the sensor that's connected to the wires on you, you start to have lots of things going on. Yeah. And that so, kind of can change your movement. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, I used to once upon a time was a volleyball player and there are some people that can go out and, you know, so for example, I have these, you know, a couple bracelets on or whatnot. Remember uh, the Lance Armstrong bracelets and, and all of the ones that came after that to commemorate, you know, sometimes it's, you know, somebody yep. they know personally, whatever. I can't play with that stuff on my hand. I, I, it just, the, the sensation of it messes with, you know, you know, my proprioception even just where, where I'm too cognizant of what my stuff on my wrist is doing to do the right. Maybe I'm just not that good at volleyball and that's an, <laughs> that's an entirely different conversation, but I do feel I can, I can anecdotally at least relate to the fact that the more stuff is on me, it starts to change how I move and makes it less natural. I would assume. Right. Yeah. And one of the things we're doing in our, one of our current studies um, to get to the topic of pain that I think we're supposed to get to eventually um, <laughs> We actually, <laughs> this is the cool part. We get to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, but the, so one of our current studies is looking at thumb osteoarthritis. So it affects kind of the base joint of your thumb. Mm -hmm. And your thumb is controlled by nine different muscles, all of which, if you want data from, you have to use this indwelling EMG technique. Mm -hmm. So we're actually recording data before we put in the electrodes and after to say, okay, how much is this affecting things? And the data we're collecting is pretty simple. It's like pinch as hard as you possibly can before I do anything to you. And right. then do that after I've put stuff in you. And what we're seeing is everybody's force goes down a little bit, mm -hmm. which is natural because I've now kind of interrupted your kind of those proprioception right. and those kinds of things. But we're seeing differences and our and is our sample size is super small. So none of this is conclusive at this point. But the the healthy individuals that have no pain, no disease, are actually being more affected by kind of having the equipment on them and in them than our um, patients who are, you know, have a chronic pain state. Mm -hmm. And kind of right now, our only conclusion is like, okay, they can just, they're more used to compensating for pain and kind of overcoming that. Mm -hmm. And they don't care that it's like, oh, that hurts a little bit. And like, I can feel something because they're probably getting kind of disrupted sensory information all the time. Sure. Well, and, and from what we know um, with chronic pain states, there's, a, there's also the possibility that, that any of the, the interpretation of those signals that, you know, we know that, that it, over long term, people that experience long term pain in, in transition into these chronic pain states, their pain modulation becomes altered. And when we talk about pain modulation, it's it's either you know the the inhibition of a pain signal or the elevation of that pain yeah. signal, right? So that balance, right? And of course, obviously you know all of this, but you know just to keep mm -hmm. everybody on the same page. So I wonder also if you think that maybe uh, because of that, uh, because of the in their brain, not so much anything in the periphery, that if if they're altered, I guess to say, um, to perceive this this uncomfortable stimulus differently um that 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 maybe it's not even a matter of they're used to dealing with it and not changing their behavior but maybe they just don't register it like everyone else yeah that's totally possible and the, that study is being done in collaboration with um dr yanis la cruz almeida so mm -hmm. if we manage to have one of our grants um hit on that i'm sure she will be all over the Wanting to record exactly what's happening well, with some if, of those signals. If anybody can find it, she can. But that's it. She's she's pretty darn good at what she does too. So yeah. But... Um, so I do. Uh, I had a, a question um, before we go too far on in in talking about um, you know some of the thumb joint and so on and so forth. Um, so when at what point did you become interested in that specifically? Because for people that are outside of academia. The idea of, well, I have this broad scope of knowledge, which as an engineer, you certainly do. Mm -hmm. um, but what gets lost in translation a little bit is people think, oh, well, you have a PhD, so you must, you know, you're Yoda, essentially. You, you're all wise, all knowing, and you, you know, 
But that's not really the case. We, we tend uh, over the course of our career to hone in on, you know, a more specific discipline, a certain area within that discipline, et cetera. Um, was it was it a need or was it something specific about the thumb joint in thumb OA? Because that's actually an interesting joint as well. It's a, a little bit different type of joint. Um, is there something that that about that that you said specifically like, oh, well, what I do would really be good here? Or how did you get to that point? Yeah, so I joke that um, my lab and my interests really focus on the forgotten joints of the human body. So my PhD work was in the wrist, Mm -hmm. um, which really got me knowledgeable about the wrist and hand. And I chose that project because it was clinically oriented. Like, I didn't want to be a doctor, but I still wanted to be, you know, doctor adjacent. Sure. I like that, doctor adjacent. Yeah. Yeah. And then my postdoc work, I actually had the opportunity. I went to University of Utah and worked in the Department of Orthopedics, so fully integrated with their team. And when I went and talked to my postdoc advisor about potential projects, he offered me two. I, there was an opportunity with the foot and ankle, mm-hmm. and there was an opportunity in the spine. And I said, oh, the foot and ankle sounds pretty good because, you know, evolutionarily, the wrist and the ankle are identical. <laughs> the, there are a lot of reasons that they're very different right, at this stage right, of evolution. Right. But but once upon a time. Yeah. But yeah, but once upon a time, yeah. they were very similar. And I wasn't scared of the... These are areas of the body that have lots of bones, lots of muscles, kind of too much going on to fully understand. And the I think one of the cool things about working on those areas is there's a lot of open questions. So a lot of students, when they come and in interview to work in my lab, ask, they're like, oh, why aren't you working on the knee or the hip? And it's like, there are great researchers out there on the knee. <laughs> and you really, you really have to fight for space there because That's there's the a truth. lot of people doing knee osteoarthritis, ACL tears, mm-hmm. um, and all of that. The hand and wrist community and the foot and ankle community are really small, tight-knit communities, like naming 10 biomechanists that work in the hand like you start having trouble around number seven (laughs) and they're like we are bigger than that but we're a community where it's like it really is everybody knows each other and there's space for everybody to work on different things well that's really interesting uh to if i can kind of circle back a little bit what i was going to 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 ask before you went too far on is about the thumb joint so earlier on we were talking about gross anatomy and cadaver anatomy and whatnot and there are actually two points of your spinal cord that get, you know, pretty substantially thicker. And that's because of all the nerves that emanate from those points. Um, and if one is in the lower spine, right? And that innervates and, and kind of, it gives us a hint to, to evolutionarily how important some of our function is, right? So uh, balance and, and, and ambulation and whatnot. So all the nerves that go out to our legs to, to manage that stuff. But just as significant is in the upper spine for all the nerves that pass out to the upper extremity. And so motor neurons, sensory neurons, because we have both, right? We have the, yep. the, the need for fine motor movement. Um, before I started my PhD, I was trying to decide, much akin to what you were talking about, I wasn't really throwing medicine in the mix, but it's like, well, do I want to go to PA school and practice medicine in that respect uh, as a physician's assistant or physician's associate? PT school or a PhD. And I kind of thought the same thing that you were, were getting at earlier. It's like, well, if I, if I get a PhD, then, then hopefully my work can be used by all of these doctors. And of course you have grandiose ideas about mm-hmm. what you can accomplish. Um, and so when I was going through that process, I actually took some time and, and, and shadowed some PTs and whatnot. And one of the physical therapists that I work with, uh, he said, yeah, you need to be able to palpate these things. So practice put a quarter in your pocket and see if you can feel which side is heads and which side is tails and then work your way to a nickel and to a penny and to a dime. And so you have, of course you can't do that without all of this, this fine innervation. Um, And so I guess what I was going to get at from all of that is, is the reason why these areas for upper extremities, you know, particularly wrist and whatnot, uh, biomechanics limited because it's, what you do specifically with, with you know, these computational analyses and, and machine learning to, to answer some of these questions or at least address them, because we didn't have the ability to do that and it's not necessarily as important with something like the knee. Like you, you, it seems like the, the complexity of the upper extremity requires a skill set that you specifically have. Did that lean into to that decision also? Is, that, is any of that off base? or 
Yeah, so I think the complexity question, like, it didn't really drive me, but it's definitely been dry, driving the field. So I'm not that I'm not that old um, <laughs> yet. But even during my PhD, which, you know, I graduated um, with my PhD in 2014. Okay. What the state of the art in musculoskeletal modeling when I joined the lab was one of the projects was actually trying to simulate um, ASL, so American Sign Language. Mm-hmm. So like, okay, I'm going to make a W. I'm going to make an L. And like, you can see that like, that takes a second and a half, if that. Mm-hmm. So we had these simulations that were about two seconds of information, and it would take us 48 hours to run them. Oh, wow. And we're now at the point, like particularly at the University of Florida, thanks to HyperGator, which is our um, cluster-based supercomputer, that mm-hmm. I have students that are running 20,000 simulations of that same length over the weekend. That's cool. So I think a lot of advances have been made just because our computational power has gotten bigger and better over time. Is there any crossover with – so for in this the ASL thing made me think of this. Is there any crossover with what you're doing in, in robotics? So instead of just modeling it on a screen, for example, um, actually representing that in, in a robotic arm or robotic hand? Yeah, so there's definitely people that work in that. Um, my lab, not so much, The um, which is really because – one of my driving things is I want to be able to answer questions that, you know, clinicians can't answer on their own mm-hmm. and aren't really being done in the industry space. So one of the really cool things about orthopedic surgery, everybody knows about hip implants or knee implants or these large devices that get made. And it's like, oh, yes, you can go work for an orthopedic device company. If you're making an implant, they can make money off of that. Right. The surgeons also have a lot of say over like, well, do I change the tension in this muscle? Do I change the position of this muscle when I do this surgery? And, you know, sutures are not where the orthopedic device companies are making their money. (laughs) So so there aren't as many kind of um, economic reasons to kind of study those questions, which I think is a great place for academia to step in. And it's also a great place for modeling to step in. So how prevalent then is something like the osteoarthritis that affects the wrist or thumb, or is that, uh, how many people are, are involved with that? Um, yeah, so I think you're cueing me that we, we have a slide <laughs> on that. Um, <laughs> but the, one of the c- kind of um, things about osteoarthritis, and it's true of a lot of these kind of de- um, dege- degenerative diseases that occur with aging, is the prevalence changes um, over time. And you can see on this graph that's showing you age across the bottom, so from 30 to 90 years old, and percentage of people with thumb osteoarthritis. It increases to nearly, like, by the time you're over 90, 100% of people have it. And I think that, like, the prevalence measures are a little deceptive because this is 100% of people have radiographic evidence. So if Mm -hmm. I take an x-ray of your hand, I'm going to see degeneration at that thumb joint. Okay. So before I, before I get into my question, I I want to, for anybody that's listening along on the audio only versions, just describe this graph a little bit. And, and if you want to interject at any point, please feel free since this is your material here that you brought. Um, but as you said, we're looking at different age groups uh, by years. So 31 to 40, 41 to 50, et cetera, all the way up to 90 or, or older than 90, I should say. Um, and then the percentage of prevalence of this carpo metacarpal osteoarthritis, so the, the thumb joint at the base of the thumb. And as I'm looking at it, I can see both uh, men and women. And it seems like in the 31 to 40 age range, um, is is really it looks like one of only two age ranges on the chart where it's more prevalent in men than women, but it's still what somewhere around seven percent for men and you know four to five percent for women. But as you get older, those percentages pretty uh, I guess aggressively rise. So when we're looking, like you said, at at the over ninety crowd. That's pretty high. Big difference between men and women in that group, actually. Uh, yeah, so. but I'll point out that there's that little asterisk there that what the figure caption actually tells you is that they had very few men over mm-hmm. 90. Um, so they're guessing that's an underestimation. And the other kind of entertaining thing about the article this um, graph comes out of, and I'm going to get the title slightly wrong, 
but the title is roughly Death, Taxes, and Thumb Osteoarthritis. <laughs> the things that the you can't th- count The things out, right? that you can't, like, avoid. Right. And <laughs> I think what it really shows is these degenerative diseases, you like... Yes, your body starts to degenerate with age. That's why we have all sorts of people studying aging and how we can um, kind of pre- prevent those negative effects. Right. But even if you have a degenerative joint, that doesn't mean you're going to be in pain and I was just need gonna, surgery. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Okay, so with the knee, we see this a lot. As a matter of fact, this is where part of my focus is in, in my research. But there's, there's a, um, there aren't clear lines drawn between the radiographic evidence that you mentioned. So you take an x-ray and, and there are these, there are hallmarks of joint degeneration that you can look at the x-ray and say, yes, there, there's some ossification here or there's changes in the joint spacing there, et cetera. What's interesting is you can't draw a clear line to say, okay, this degree of joint degeneration results in this amount of pain. Or, just to complicate things a little bit more, this degree of dysfunction. You may have some people that you look at their x-ray and you go, wow, your knee is horrible. How much pain are you in? They're like, meh. You know, and and, and if you were to to do some gait analysis on them, that may or may not, their their gait may or may not represent the degree of, of their joint degeneration. Do you see the same thing in this thumb joint? Yeah, absolutely. And we actually, we had a interesting kind of um, finding off some of our kind of early work. So we only have about eight subjects worth of data right now. And we're, we actually have more people with thumb, diagnosed thumb osteoarthritis than our healthy controls, but we have a handful of healthy controls. And for a recent grant application, we said, oh, we need to know what the radiographic classification is. So the orthopedic surgery community has a classification system for thumb osteoarthritis that says it's one to four. Four means you have really bad joint degeneration. You definitely have thumb osteoarthritis. One is you're starting to maybe kind of show signs of aging. And I sent a set of the x-rays to um, one of our surgical collaborators and said, can you just grade these for me? You know, there aren't that many. Put it on the one to four scale. And it was blinded so that they weren't, you know, um, biased by what other doctors had said and why we had been referred these individuals to participate in our research. And one of our healthy subjects came back as a grade of four. And I was like, hmm, maybe you made a mistake. Like, that doesn't seem right to me. Like, they were our healthiest, youngest subjects. Right. And I sent it to another surgeon. Saying, you know, I just wanted to double check these numbers, you know, do my due diligence. And I got back the exact same answer. And I think what that really shows is we don't know this connection between kind of what's happening at the joint in terms of degeneration and inflammation and all of those kind of properties Mm -hmm. combined with movement Mm -hmm. and how you're like, you know, if my joint surface is changing shape, I'm going to move differently because... That's two different things sliding together differently. Sure. And then you have the pain perception that says, you know, some people may be compensating through movement or other things to say, I'm not actually going to experience pain in the same way. Well, and and also I should probably put an addendum on what I was saying earlier is that that there's a, a fair documentation in the literature of just the opposite also. People report high levels of pain and you look at your joint and say, yeah, mm, you, you're fine. You know, according to the, to their whatever grading scale and, and with the knee, it's the KL scale, the Kelgren Lawrence scale. Yep. Um, is it the same for, what do they, who? Yeah. So, so the Kelgren Lawrence scale can be applied broadly. Um, but the, the specific thumb, um, scale is the Eaton Littler. Okay. Scale. Um, the Apparently, or, the, the nobody or, can come up with these on their own. They always have to have somebody working with them, right? There's two. Yeah, there, yeah. there's always the, <laughs> the, the, the two people. Um, but I think one of the things, and you hear it from the surgeons all the time, and you hear it from physical therapists, and pretty much anyone actually working in the clinical space, is we're going to listen to the patient, yeah. and we're going to treat the patient's symptoms and what the patient experiences. Because we can't go and treat the, like, great, you have joint degeneration. Should I, like, we don't have those preventative treatments that say, okay, I can do this to you at 40 
And now you won't be in pain when you're 60 or 80. But do you think that that's the direction that some of this technology, the research, the medicine is going? I think it's like, I think it's a direction we all want to go. Um, I think a lot of that's going to be in the pharmaceutical solutions. So mm-hmm. I do not like to venture guesses at right. how that world um, evolves their research. But I think kind of the short term goal in my space is really understanding the great. We have people that have figured out how to move without pain. Mm -hmm. And we have people that are clearly in pain. Are those two groups moving differently? And if they are moving differently, can we design an occupational therapy or physical therapy regime that says, okay, I'm going to take you from the you're in pain, teach you how to move like these people that aren't in pain. And will that kind of make your pain go away? And we're a long way from, you know, doing that clinical trial, but I think that's kind of where we're headed. That's fascinating. I, you know, that this is something that I come upon in, in aging research also that, that, and I, I definitely don't want to take credit for, for being the only or the first or anything like that. Plenty of other people have come to this conclusion, but I think the same idea applies here that there is some precedent Um, or maybe I should say an antecedent, an event or a condition that leads later on, it seems, to to some, whether it's a chronic pain state or or compensations in movement, um, even joint degeneration, um, that we oftentimes, even though we're sometimes critical of medicine, and when I say we, I don't mean the research community, I mean society in general. So, well, instead of preventing, we only treat once something's wrong. But this just highlights how difficult it is to find out what that state or condition is, at least in knee osteoarthritis and thumb osteoarthritis, when when you can't say, okay, well, you're a healthy patient, like you said with that example, you said, but then they're not radiographically or vice versa. You know, we're we're gonna put you in this in this other group because you're high pain, which is exactly what you know, physicians should be dealing with because those are the things that that alter your life, your quality of life, your your function, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, if we could somehow rewind even more and look at what, and I'm going to air quotes here for everybody that's listening along, what normal is prior to any of these deviations in functionality or in pain processing uh, or in, in, in structural changes to the joint that are related to age or use or whatever, then, you know, the backtracking, it seems like there's a lot of room in that space to, to start to look at, well, what's normal and what starts to deviate from that to, to connect the dots longitudinally to, well, people that, that present this way at 20 or 15 uh, as they're going through, maybe even as they're going through puberty developmentally, are more likely to end up in this group later on, whether it's a pain group or whatever. But it seems like that's, it's just so complex. Yeah, I think osteoarthritis as a disease actually gives you some opportunities to do that in creative ways because you might have heard the terms primary osteoarthritis and secondary osteoarthritis. Mm-hmm. So primary osteoarthritis tends to be what we think of as the like, your joints degenerating over time. And it's obviously more complicated than that. And every time I say joint degeneration, I think of my colleague, Dr. Kyle Allen, who really does have a great pitch on osteoarthritis is a disease of the joint. It affects everything, not mm-hmm. just your bone deteriorating. Right. But that's true with the knee and the hip, and that's why we kind of associate those with aging. We also have things like ankle osteoarthritis and wrist osteoarthritis that are secondary, um, also termed post-traumatic. So if you have a terrible ankle fracture in your 20s because you were that college athlete or just the daredevil who, you know, did something creative on a ski slope, Mm -hmm. you are more likely to end up developing ankle osteoarthritis over time. And that's going to typically happen earlier than we see with knee or hip. And I think that starts to kind of allow you kind of opportunities to tease apart the like, oh, you had a preceding event. Now we can actually longitudinally track how that's developing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's still an open question regarding like, it, are osteoarthritis is primary and secondary osteoarthritis the same disease, different diseases, related diseases? And you saw this in the cancer world over the last decade, where we're now doing cancer phenotyping that says we can't treat all cancer differently. We come up with kind of unique markers mm-hmm. for different types of cancer, and I think we're going to get there with osteoarthritis. 
So with with some of the computational modeling that you're using, you mention a lot about force uh, with with that are ex- that's exerted by the musculature, but you also just very briefly teased the idea of structural changes in bone translate to different movements, degrees of freedom, et cetera. Are you looking at any of those things as well, or is it more specifically the musculature? So we mostly look at musculature and kind of those changes on force. So one of the thing, one of the properties we can measure is it called a joint reaction force, which basically is the force between two bones at a joint. So I can say, okay, at the thumb joint, if I, you know, when I push on something with my thumb, that force propagates through and then causes a force vector on my carpometacarpal joint. Mm -hmm. And one of the open questions that we're looking at is, okay, if I have thumb osteoarthritis, does that vector have a different direction? Does it have a different magnitude and therefore is causing changes in how that joint's compressing? Mm -hmm. Now, we also have colleagues that then kind of take it the next step through finite element modeling which allows you to look at kind of the actual structure and the stresses and the strains on the actual bone and start to get towards those deterioration questions. And um, there are so many unanswered questions at the muscle level that we kind of say, okay, (laughs) we get to the, this is the force applied, but that ends up being an input to um, the finite element models. And the lab that I did my postdoc on, at actually did, has really elegant methods. Um, Andy, Ander, Dr. Andy Anderson, who's at University of Utah, mm-hmm. has super awesome ways of saying like, okay, I go from this musculoskeletal model, get those forces, and then I input those forces into a finite element model, and then I figure out how that's affecting kind of joint degeneration and yeah, the, so bo- the bone. I, what what I love about that also, because part of what we're trying to do here is is – speak to to non-academic members of our audience as well that are science nerds um, that uh, that maybe don't have training in engineering or, in, or in, in biomedical engineering or anything like that, but that love this stuff. And so what you just illustrated, I think very well, is the fact that there are all of these sub-disciplines within any given field and that there's so much to answer that you th- there also is is an additional sub element or sub discipline that has to put some of these things together, right? So if you look at the you know, if you look at the view from 200 feet up and you're looking at the big picture, there's a way in science where all of these things begin to overlap, and that no single field has all of the answers because you can't. There's just not enough time in the day. There's there's not enough you know technology that you need to rely on some of these other parts. And so the collaboration of, of, of research overall um, in and of itself can get really complex, but that's what creates the scientific community. Yeah, and the, I think the, that kind of makes me think of one of the other slides that I brought, which is this. Um, that wasn't a hint for the record. I know I looked down <laughs> at that slide. That wasn't a hint at all, but good, but, good segue. Yeah, but so we, we have a slide that shows kind of biomechanics and pain. And the what you kind of see here is like there's, there's two eyes at the top. Um, and that really represents kind of two different viewpoints from two different fields. So biomechanics is going to look at the neural control of movement, how joint loading and these joint forces work, how that impacts mechanical um, degradation. Where in the pain side, we're looking at all of those sensory um, aspects. And how that is actually affecting your pain experience. And I think one of the hard parts, um, we're currently looking at this in thumb osteoarthritis, but I think it affects kind of any musculoskeletal disease that causes pain, which there's a lot of. Mm -hmm. And we're really at the point of we have these two siloed fields that haven't really been working together and talking to each other. So I tell my students that when you go and you read the biomechanics literature and you're reading about pretty much the... The classic study of I have a group of people that have a disease and I have a group of people that are healthy and a group of people with the disease move differently. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in the discussion, the authors typically pontificate and say, oh, one of the things that causes that difference is probably pain. But for the most part, pain is not robustly measured. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, on the, the pain researchers are doing all this amazing work saying, okay, how can I actually quantify pain? How do I look at kind of the differences in the subjective pain experience and figure out all of that heterogeneity? 
but they're not doing really robust characterization of movement. They're doing things like saying, oh, I went and I measured gait speed or kind of measured some of the easy movement things the same way that the biomechanists are like, yeah, I just asked them on a one to 10 <laughs> scale if right. they were in pain. That was enough, right? So, so you're one slide with that with that binocular view here um, and, and the overlap between. Basically, in one PowerPoint slide has summed up why I hope to have a career in <laughs> research. <laughs> because you're exactly right. There's And there are those of us who, who are applied physiologists, kinesiologists, that uh, – that have the means, at least in our background, similar to what you did with engineering, that have now shifted. And, and so for me, that shift was into pain research, but I found the exact same thing, um, where I would speak with with some of my colleagues and, and, and even, even mentors who are, are world-renowned in one discipline and say, okay, well, you know, what physical measures did you take? And, and this could be, because, and, and it typically is, because the purpose of their study from which the data came, didn't really have much to do with movement of any kind. And so they would throw in whether, you know, in, in the same way that when I was in, you know, my un, in my uh, graduate studies, rather, throughout my PhD, I would ask, okay, well, rate your pain, 1 to 10. And that's it. But there, there's a lot more to pain research than that. Now I'm, I'm on the pain side in looking at this, and I said, well, what, what functional measures do you have? I said, well, well, we timed their walk speed. I'm like, great, that's a great yeah. start. And then what? And they're like, and then we timed their walk speed, <laughs> and that's, you know, and that's what there is. And again, like I said, that's that's not any kind of, of slight to those to those studies or to those researchers. It's just that the focus was different. So it does seem like there's a space for people like you and for people like me, hopefully, within that gray area where there's the overlap of, of the, the you know vision of the two fields, like in your slide where there's really a lot of room to start to pull elements from both of, of the disciplines and really get at where the rubber meets the road, and no pun intended, you know, because you're an upper extremity biomechanist, you're, you know, not with gait, but, but where the rubber meets the road and say, okay, how do these factors combine to really change how we go about our day-to-day -day function, our quality of life, how we experience life, how we move, what we're capable of doing and not capable of doing, and, and start to look at those intersections. And I think that's where, for me at least, things start to get really fascinating. Yeah, but it's also where things start to get really hard. So <laughs> that's the, true. Um, one of the things I did along my training um, is get a master's degree in medical humanities and bioethics. Oh, interesting. And the one of the most valuable things I learned um, – was they made a big point about the fact that interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and cross-disciplinary are not synonyms. And 100%. The, I think we all have this dream of interdisciplinary research, and the true interdisciplinary researcher fully speaks both languages. Mm -hmm. And like that slide showing biomechanics and pain like I am very much still on the biomechanics side. Mm -hmm. So I really view it as cross-disciplinary research. We're looking at it right now as like, I'm on the biomechanics side. I work with Yanis L. Cruz Almeida, who's very much on the pain side. And we're trying to figure out where's the intersection. And I think one of the really rewarding parts is that the PhD student on the project is being that and becoming that interdisciplinary researcher exactly. because she's being forced to learn both fields exactly. in a deeper way then we're kind of being forced at the faculty level of learning the other person's Which field. gets at why PhD students get very little sleep, <laughs> right? Yeah, that, so in reality, though, and, and I'll throw a reference out that some will get and some won't, but in reality, you don't get the, you know, the, the Tony Starks or even maybe b the, the Bruce Banners who in, in fiction have, you know, eight PhDs and they're just experts in everything and blah, blah, blah. But the fact of the matter is, is and that harkens back to what we were talking about before. There's only so many hours in a day. There's so many years, you know, in, in an education where you can amass this expertise before you start to apply it. And that in of itself has its limitations. Yeah. And it's why it's important to find the people that you can work with and yeah. like, will, like actually get along with um, in order to <laughs> In order to form these effective teams. Yeah. So if we could, if we could take out our crystal ball here, and and within your field specifically, and then some of these, um, you know, cross disciplinary perspectives, what what's in the near future, you know, just over the horizon, um, with both regard to technology and how it's applied in what you do, and, and maybe um, go a little bit beyond that, 
and uh, speculate, of course, just speculation, on uh, how this may be impactful to to people at the clinical level. Yeah, so I'm not sure this is technically short term, but one of our goals is to figure out how do we actually incorporate pain into our musculoskeletal models. And like I, t- I talked about force equals mass times acceleration. There's a gr- like physics gives you an equation for how movement Pretty cut works. and dry. As far as I know, there is not a universal mathematical equation describing pain. Um, so it gets more complicated to say, okay, how do you actually incorporate that? And the how do you um, do you can you do that at the muscle level, which is kind of our our models right now kind of start and stop at the muscle level. Do we have to actually connect it to a brain and um, kind of incorporate that kind of here's how the brain is affecting the muscles? How do you incorporate that sensory information? So that's kind of the like the dream in the musculoskeletal modeling world is I need my model to not just move. I need my model to be able to actually say, you know, I'm on, on that one to 10 scale. I'm currently happy and not in pain versus I'm very much in pain. Mm-hmm. And I think the kind of the, the steps to get there and um, if you'd asked me kind of during my training, like I t- the, if you go to my lab website and you say, okay, what does this lab do? I say that we do predictive simulations. And if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have shown you a musculoskeletal computer model and been like, this is, this is how we're going to do all of these predictions. And now the image that I show is a musculoskeletal computer model with kind of a cartoon of machine learning techniques. Mm-hmm. Because the machine learning, it's another one of those scary words that people are like, I can't do that. I don't know what that means. But it's really just techniques to say, okay, we have large quantities of data and we're trying to make sense of all of that data. Mm -hmm. And if we collect sufficient data, we can start to say like, okay, this is your movement pattern. This is your pain experience. And I can start to kind of parse out the, okay, for you as an individual, I'm going to be able to predict your function and your pain experience and maybe someday be able to say, okay, I've tweaked the model and I've put in a a surgery or I've put in a physical therapy regime and I can tell you if you go do surgery, this will be your pain experience and this will be your movement and function afterwards. If you go do physical therapy, this is what you're going to get. And then that can inform a clinician to have that conversation with a patient and say, okay, like wh- where do we want, like this? these are the pros and cons of both options. Where can we actually um, make it, like what do you actually want out of kind of your treatment plan? I love it. So that, and that's, you know, what a lot of people look for, I think, um, particularly in the community and, and from a layman perspective, you know, I've, I've, I have friends and, and colleagues that do everything from looking at how, you know, a particular protein affects an organelle at the smallest level, you know, subcellular level, all the way up to, to people that are, are right on the other side of, of, you know, clinical application. And I know a lot of people, that's the question with science is, well, how do we get from this? I mean, this is all fascinating and it's fun to talk about. And how do we get from this to it actually helping people? But it sounds like even if it's in the future, maybe not so near, there is a clear objective. And, and if the, if the pathway isn't necessarily clear between here and there, at least the direction is in what you're working on. And that's really exciting stuff. Yeah. And I think the our ability to predict things is only going to get better. Like I, the within academia, I think one of our biggest rate limiting steps right now is just availability of data. On the flip side, if you go to industry, a lot like this is true of a lot of the medical industries, they're collecting all sorts of data on their devices. Mm-hmm. Some of that's because they're required to by the FDA. Some of it's because their R and D team wants that data. So I think there's kind of over the next decade going to be a lot of opportunities for academic industry collaborations that say we have these grand ideas we have these cool tools that are under development to do that prediction if we can start kind of integrating that with existing data sets in order to actually start doing it on a you know 
start on a small scale. Like, mm-hmm. what can you predict today before you get to the, I'm going to predict your entire you know, <laughs> right. quality of life. Yeah. You're five. Get ready for thumb <laughs> osteoarthritis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and open invitation. You know, we, we got into a little bit of, of some of the details of your work, but I'm sure that there is a lot more. And even even in the things that we discussed, you're you're ongoing in collecting data. So I'd be really interested to hear how uh, some of this turns out. And I think I can speak for our audience as well. So open invitation. I'd love to have you back on at some point. Um, but in the meantime, uh, do you want to share your lab web page? Uh, so if people want and we'll put this up on the screen uh, for people watching. But if you're listening along, where can where can people look at, at some of the work that you're doing right now? Yeah, so I run the Muscoscale Biomechanics Lab, which is a lab within the J. Creighton Pruitt Family Department of Biomedical Engineering um, here at University of Florida. And our webpage is um, bme.ufl.edu backslash labs backslash Nichols. And you can also just find it by Googling my name. Um, we pop up pretty quickly. And then we're also on Twitter. Oh, you just you just threw out the Google. <laughs> oh, nice. And it's N-I-C-H-O-L-S, correct, yes. Nichols? All right. Fantastic. And I do want to point this out because it seems of late I'm coming across all of these people who come up with fantastic acronyms. And so biomechanics, and I'm going to read this because biomechanics is a longer word. But is this your acronym? And this is your, is this the, yep. what the when when we talk about the Nichols Musculoskeletal Biomechanics Lab, this is the biomechanics. Yeah. So one of the hard parts when you're designing a lab is you have um, a lot of cool lab names out there. So I did <laughs> I did my PhD training in the Arms Lab, which was an upper limb modeling lab, and um, one of their close collaborators is the Mobile Lab. Um, mm. And I didn't have the creativity to come up with kind of that like really catchy short acronym but i knew i wanted musculoskeletal in the lab name i knew i wanted biomechanics in the lab ma- name and then i started thinking about kind of what does biomechanics mean to me which is where the acronym came from okay so i'm going to i'm going to if i may let me roll this out there on biomechanics now follow along building informative open source models examining complex human activities and navigating interpretation of computer simulations yep okay well Look, most people try to attack things like price or, you know, these these five-letter words to attach acronyms to. um, That's next level. All right. Well, thank you so much for the time, and, uh, and I look forward to having you back on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining this episode of The Price of Pain. Opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and guests and not representative of the University of Florida or parent institutions of our guests, unless specifically stated. You can find more information about Price on the World Wide Web at price.ctsi.ufl.edu. And keep up with our researchers on social media by searching Facebook for UF Price, by following at UF underscore pain on Twitter, and Price of Pain podcast, all one word, on Instagram.